Thanks for stopping by. Join me as I read chapter three of The Coldest Winter Ever by Sister Soja. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, turn on your notification bell, and share it with your friends. Let's get started. Chapter three. Daddy, I said softly, trying to lean on my innocent baby doll look. I want to get my hair done at Erlene's next Friday. Since in some type of plot, Santiago asked, why would you go all the way to Brooklyn to get your hair done? Can't you go somewhere around here? Come on, Daddy, I pleaded. They don't know how to hook my do up out here. Erlene be having my shit, excuse me, my hair looking correct. There's plenty of hair, plenty of black hairdressers out here. Go to White and Not. That's a 45-minute ride. It just doesn't make sense for my baby to be riding a bunch of trains and buses just to get to Brooklyn. Bus, train? Trust me, Daddy, I wasn't talking about riding either. I'm straight up hitting on you for a ride when you drive in on Friday. I said, laughing and begging at the same time. Winter, you know I don't mix business and pleasure. I do my runs solo. I don't want you to deal with that or knowing more than what you need to know. It's not smart. And I've never been a stupid man. Just lay low for a while. Your mother will have her car in a couple of weeks. Then you and her go ripping around to take care of all that girly shit. Anyway, he said with his cool face and a half smile, there ain't a female in the state who looks better than Winter, even without Earlene's help. Even in my disappointed moment, a compliment felt good and worked, as it did every time. I accepted Santiago's rationale and went back to my room to reshuffle my deck and think of another angle to get me into Brooklyn. Days later, I called Sterling, my old sugar daddy, out of the blue. After racking my brain for a plan to get into Brooklyn, I realized he was the only sucker I knew who could get such a kick out of seeing me that he would drive all the way out here to get me. The price of the whole arrangement was that I'd have to tolerate him, act like I gave a damn about him when I didn't. I have to think of quick answers to all the, his wimpy benching questions about where I had been, why I cut out on him like I did, why I never called him, blah, blah, blah. Then I have to find a clever way to ditch him because I definitely wasn't spending my Friday night with him. I'd have to be firm so he wouldn't start that damn whining. I'd also have to be sweet, so if I had to use him again as my taxi driver from time to time, he would cooperate. The worst thing that might happen is I might have to end up giving him some pussy just to get him in line or a quick blowjob while he was driving. I wasn't sweating it, though. I had done it with him before, and I could easy do it again especially get the hell out of Long Island. Soon as Santiago's legs ripped out of the driveway Friday afternoon, I saw Sterling pull up in his little Lee car with a broken fender. I swallowed hard and got ready to pretend it was a limo. When I told my mom I was going to Erlene's, she wanted to come too. I explained she should not come because I was spending the night at Aunt Lori and would not be able to get her a ride back after she finished at Erlene's. She screwed up her face as though she had a problem with me spending the night at her own sister's house. I quickly added that I would be back first thing Saturday morning to watch the kids. She let go of her anger and I jetted. Adrenaline was pumping inside Erlene's. I was like a junkie getting a fix as I got filled in on the what haps around the way. The girls dropped the regular shit on me, like who's bumping who, who's pregnant, who's paid, who's not and why, who's locked down, how long, and who's due to come home. Now, Natalie was giving me the elbow, her discreet way of telling me to look toward the door without looking like I was looking toward the door. There go Tasia, she said out of the corner of her mouth. And, yeah, and, 
I waited, waited for the 411 on her. She's fucking with your man. Midnight. The information hit me right in the chest. She was talking about my future husband. She's big on him too. Especially since he got that new Acura with the rims. My heart dropped for a full three seconds. It took one second for me to check Tasia out. My eyes zoomed in on hers. Hmm. Cheap. 10 karat gold earrings. Then her clothes. She was chilling a little bit, strictly hip hop style. She had big taste, me titties, a small flat belly, and a round ass. She was brown skinned with chinky eyes. Regular bitch, I thought to myself. The rack that she put those clothes off had 1,000 pairs of the same shit, which means that any party, four or five girls would have it on. There was nothing unique about her or even the way she hooked up her gear. It wouldn't be hard for me to move her right on out. But damn, it was the Long Island distance that was killing me. A second later, my mind focused on what I really wanted to hear. Midnight had a new Acura, the one I would be riding in, the one he needed to have to sport a bitch like me. After my hair was better, I left with Natalie to go check my Aunt Lori. I needed to at least show my face in at her apartment and hang out for an hour or so. I knew my moms would call to check on me. I'd be out partying, but at least Aunt Lori would be able to verify that she had seen me and I would be back there to spend the night like I told my mother I would. We had plans to go to Big Mo's, the local bar and dance set that be banging on Friday nights for the young crowd. There was never no problem about Big Mo or his bouncers getting in your business and checking IDs and shit like that. I can't begin to tell you how my heart was racing just from being in the Brooklyn air again. Cars were positioned bumper to bumper for all three blocks surrounding Mo's clubs. Car and Jeep speakers were up. Each one playing their own jam. Sound systems were fighting to outblast each other. A little bit of hip hop collided with a little bit of reggae, rockers, and even slow jams. I was on foot, rolling 15 deep, straight Brooklyn style with 15 razor ready, go- razor ready girls who all had each other's back. When we got in the club, I put my plan into action. I didn't have long to work because Long Island was looming in the back of my mind like a threat. Midnight was standing on the right side of the club where the lights were low. He was kicking it with about five other niggas. I caught the side of his serious face, his muscular jaw working. I laughed to myself thinking, only this nigga would conduct business in a place where everybody else trying to get their groove on. I gave my girl Natalie the pinch and our whole crew started walking around Midnight and his boys. We rushed his crew, bumping into all of them, rubbing our titties against them, using the excuse that the club was crowded. Of course, it only took a second before my girls had his boys distracted. I stepped up, licking my lips real slowly and said rough and sexy like, What's up, Midnight? Haven't seen you in a while. I said this line with sensual power. I said it like he and I had been intimate in the past and I missed him and needed to get back with him as soon as possible. I was standing so close to him that one more inch, I could have slid my tongue down his throat. He looked at me unaffected, completely unmoved and non-emotional. My emotions were wild and my nipples were up and the muscles in my pussy were beating like a heart. What do you want? He finally said. Now I was pissed. I knew my perfume had to be working. I dabbed it on extra so when I got up close, my scent would suck him in. Hell, I had on 18 carry gold earrings and one carry diamond studs, much more than that $2 10 carry hole I heard he had been kicking it with had. I didn't want to go off. The bottom line was I wanted him, so I'd have to play it cool, make sure I pulled him in just right. I said sweetly, what do I want? I touched his hand with mine, looked him in the eye. Oh, I want it all. He put his hand back like I had a disease and slowly and coldly spit back at me. Well, that makes you like all these bitches in here, now doesn't it? Rage ripped through my chest as it had become clear I wasn't even a consideration of his. Hell, he acted like I wasn't even a woman. My mind automatically flipped to Santiago, who I know would have ripped out Midnight's tongue for even talking to me like that. 
Then, like a gypsy, midnight reading my thoughts said, what? Gun tell daddy? I'm my own man. He turned and walked away. I felt so played. I didn't even want to turn around towards my girls. I have to tell my whole crew that I got this like I was a piece of shit. I just tightened up, put on my Brooklyn rule, grabbed the next nigga standing close to me and started to dance. I was going to move with fury, let Midnight know what he was missing. I handed my coach bag to my girl and started shaking my ass all the way to Alabama, using this dumb fuck dancing in front of me like a prop as I tried to catch Midnight's attention again. My body was shaking and sweating as anger and desire fought it out. Yes, desire, because I was definitely turned on. The lightning situation made it hard for me to catch Midnight's eyes. At the point that my body wanted to collapse from exhaustion, I saw Midnight looking in my direction and headed my way. Smiling to myself, I thought, I know I'm a bad bitch. I knew he would come back. As he got closer, I realized he was signaling to his man who was standing behind me. He snatched him up and they left the club. Later that night, our crew was walking back to the PJs. I was feeling down but looked unaffected. We were joking, bugging, talking about people when a spanking new jet black gleaming Acura with rims pulled up alongside us. We all stopped to look at what I calculated was a $50,000 car with $4,500 in rims. The automatic window on the passenger side dropped down. Midnight was behind the wheel doing what he does best, looking good. I wasn't going to play the sucker role and assume he stopped for me. I had done that already tonight, so I stood in the pack with my girls. He must have known he could have called any one of us over to him and not one of us would have stopped to consider the other. All of us were probably doing the same thing, imagining ourselves in the passenger seat of that car, we just, which just increased in value as I checked the soft white leather interior and wood paneling. Winter, he called my name with roughness. That made me just want to hop on his dick and go buck. Get in. I don't remember walking to the car or nothing. I felt like I was just transformed or teleported right into the seat, like I was on Star Trek or something. I turned to the side. The automatic window was up. Midnight was pulling his finger off the control button. I saw 28 eyeballs glued to the side of my window, staring in my face. They was my girls, but they were jealous. All I could think was, yeah, that's right. What did you expect? Oh, have you forgotten? I'm the queen of this ghetto. As the window closed, I could hear Natalie's voice saying, Are you staying in my house or Aunt Lori's? I didn't respond. Just thought to myself, hopefully neither. As we rode, my confidence grew slowly. I decided he was just trying to flip the script on me, play hard to get. It didn't matter, though. He came back for me. I had made an impression on him. I had sweated him, and now he was sweating me. The air in the car was crisp and clean smelling. The stereo was so fly, it sounded like the band was playing the music live in the back seat. He wasn't saying nothing, but that was all right. I was used to his strange silence. It didn't make me mad. It made me want him more. I knew our love making would be good just based on his mysteriousness. I opened my coach bag and pulled out my little mirror. He wasn't paying me no mind. I tilted the mirror to the side angle so I could look at his face without him realizing that I was looking. He was black, all right. Beautiful. His long, thin nose and big, thick lips mounted his white teeth, white like those t-shirts he wore in the summertime. Suddenly, it seemed the music was abruptly interrupted by the loud and aggravating voice of Sister Soldier on the radio. I leaned up and reached for the button to change the station when Midnight intercepted my hand saying, don't touch my shit. I sucked my teeth, rolled my eyes, and sat stiff while Soldier went on to talk about some black struggle. Hmm, I thought. If there is some kind of struggle going on, she must be the only one in it. Everybody I know is chilling, just trying to enjoy life. She, on the other hand, with these Friday and Saturday night comments, busting up the radio, hip-hop, flavor mix, is the only one who's always uptight. I had every reason to take it personal. She started talking about how young black drug dealers are the strong black men in the community, but need to change their line of business because it's destroying the community. As far as I'm concerned, Soldier's just somebody who likes to hear herself talk. 
she obviously didn't know the time because the drug dealers don't destroy nothing. If there weren't people online to buy the product, then there would be no business. No drug dealer. I know. I never force nobody, not one person to take drugs. People do it voluntarily. They do it by choice. The niggas I know who sell drugs be trying to help the stupid crackheads. They be telling them to slow down. They be asking them, are they sure they want to sell their last whatever just to get that hit? I know a dealer who told this pregnant girl he wouldn't sell her no more crack till after she had the baby. She just took her dumb ass to somebody else and got the crack anyway. Then, when she had her baby boy, she tried to sell him too. Now, whose fault is that? People do what they want to. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe Soldier wants people to do what she wants them to do. Why are you even listening to this bullshit, I asked Midnight. What the hell do you know? He snapped back in his low and cool voice. This is when I noticed we were on the Long Island Expressway. Where are you taking me? Home, little girl, he responded. Your father paged me and asked me to bring you home. I thought you were your own man. For $150, I run an errand. It's business. I pick you up, drop you off, collect my dough, and I'm out. The $150 transaction was smooth and non-incidental as a messenger service dropping off a package. After handing midnight the money and closing the door, my father walked silently through the living room and into his den. The room was dark. He sat down, leaning back at his chair. The moonlight was through the blinds. It lit half of his serious face. Winter, he said softly. Yes, Daddy, I said. What made you think you could spend a night in Brooklyn? I asked Mommy. I wanted to see my friends. Natalie and me were supposed to. I guess you're not understanding. Not understanding what, I asked, checking my tone to ensure that I was not sounding disrespectful. Something Santiago doesn't tolerate. Who you are, who I am, who we are. He said each word with precision. He was starting to sound like some type of philosopher or something to me. This whole thing wasn't making any type of sense. You're my daughter. You just can't wander off and go anywhere unprotected. Anywhere, I said upset. I went home. I went to Brooklyn. I went to the only place I know. Where my peoples is at. Where everybody knows me. Those are my streets, Daddy. Do you think those streets love you? Those streets don't love you. They don't even know you. You could walk those streets 1,000 nights and 1,000 days, and they wouldn't even know your name. Those streets don't love nobody. It was crazy. His words were making me feel uneasy, and I couldn't connect. I didn't like the feeling. I was used to feeling relaxed and in control. So what are you saying, Daddy? Are you saying that I can't go home anymore? No, he said quickly. I'm not saying that. Because, Daddy, I'm not hiding from anybody or scared of anything. You taught me that. It's not about hiding. It's about being smart. I taught you that, too. What makes you special, Winter? He asked like it was a $50,000 Jeopardy question or some shit like that. I ran the question through my head and drew a blank. What makes you special is me, Santiago, your father, your protection. You had a full run of our projects when I lived there because I was holding things down, making everything all right. My eyes saw everything, so everything was cool. Now this is home. This is where I rest my head. If I'm here and you're over there, I can't see you. If I can't see you, I can't protect you. When you're unprotected, you're wide open. Anything can happen. But our Lori saw me. She knew I was there. Uncle Stevie was there just like usual. Look at my face, Winter, and never forget what I tell you. Santiago loves you. Your mother loves you. Don't confuse it. That's all you can depend on. Yes, Daddy. I responded softly and turned to go to my room. There was no doubt in my mind that it was time to spark an L. Luckily, I had copped a nickel bag earlier in Brooklyn. I went to the linen closet and grabbed a couple of tiles. I closed my door, pulled out my pack of incense. My mind shouted, hell no, the incense is a dead giveaway. I went to my bedroom window, opened it, and decided I'd let the breeze in to whisk the smoke out. Sitting down on my bed, I pulled off my shoes, opened up my shirt, unsnapped my bra, and let my titties breathe. I slipped on my slippers. 
walked to my dresser drawer and stuck my hand underneath my folded blouses and pulled out my Philly blunt. I cracked it open, took a tobacco out, flushed it down the toilet. I put the weed in, wrapped it, licked it, and stuck it under my nose as a teaser to my appetite. Yes, I needed to relieve my tension. I'm backed up sexually, stuck in the suburbs, and my dream lover is a mummy. Just as I went to position the towel to jam up the space in the door, my mom's knock, and without hesitation, pushed the door gently. I got up, threw the towel on the bed, and covered up the blunt I had laying there. Hey, mommy, I said, trying to act casual. I checked her face. You could always tell when Santiago was upset because it showed on my mother's face. Your father really went off when I told him you were spending the night in Brooklyn. Yeah, we talked. I said, hoping to avoid two speeches in one night. I tried to get him to loosen up, but you know how that goes, she admitted. Oh, that's a fly design you got, I said, checking her freshly sculpted, painted, and immaculate nails. Where did you go get that done? A little shop about 15 minutes away. Santiago took me. What else did you get? Don't be holding out on me. I know you got something else. Ah, uh, just a little dress for me to rock tonight at my party, she said. Yeah, I replied, disinterested. I know. That's how I'm starting to feel about the parties, too. I just need to get my whip so I could get in, out, and around. When do you think you'll get it? If I have it my way, and I always do, I'll get it next weekend, she smiled confidently. Yeah, but the way Santiago was talking, even after you get it, we ain't allowed in Brooklyn. Now you know that's crazy. He's just protective and sometimes he overdoes it. But girl, we can sneak, she said smiling. Her mahogany skin was glowing in my damn light. Mommy was pretty all right. A definite advantage to having babies at a young age. You get to chill with your moms like she's your sister or something. Fuck are those old stiff bastards complaining about teenage pregnancy, this and that. Me and my moms could party together. Nobody would even know she was my mom's. I got some shit in my closet that looks better on her than it does on me. I know some niggas from around my way in Brooklyn that'd rather fuck her than me. Now, if they never admit that, it would be suicidal. Suicidal? Santiago would. Oh, yeah. Just the thought of daddy snapped me back into reality. Sneak to Brooklyn, I said. I laughed. Santiago runs Brooklyn. There's no sneaking in and out of his territory. Hell, he beat Midnight at the club and had him bring me home and bears the shit out of me. How did I know? How did he know I was there? Well, you know, Big Mo got to answer to Santiago, Mom said. Being vague. Speaking of Midnight, I bet you like riding in his car, she smiled knowingly. What? I played it off. She had laid back on my bed, rolled over, and started tickling me like I was a little girl or something. Hitting all my secret spots, I cracked up with laughter. Midnight's cool, I said matter-of-factly. Don't front on me, little hooker, she said, like she was really one of my girlfriends. I see the way you look at him. When, I asked. When, okay. When you were 13, when you were 14, when you were 15, when you were 16, she laughed. He's a good catch, though, a good man, loyal, paid, strong. He don't like me, though. I said, admitting something I would never tell one of my girlfriends. It's not that, she said. Midnight just likes life. Santiago will squeeze the life out of him. I wish that were the truth. No, I'm saying I wish it was like he was just scared of Santiago. I'm saying he straight up don't like me at all, period, as a woman. He talks cold, says very little. He didn't even try to be nice to me on the way home. Trust me, there is no way he don't like my baby. You're young, fine, you got everything a girl could want. Pretty hair, beautiful eyes, clothes and jewels. It's just got to be Santiago standing in the way. So when do you think Santiago will stop standing in my way? Who knows, she said, aspirated. My mother got up and headed towards the door. As she stepped out of my room, she leaned her head back and smiled. And don't like that joint in the house. That will really make Santiago snap. Damn, I thought to myself. Seems like the both of them know everything, but nobody was going to stop me from getting my buzz on. I crawled outside my window, sat on my little slanted side of the roof, 
and puff my lie in the spring breeze and moonlight. After the feeling of no worries came over me, I leaned back, closed my eyes, and drifted into the night. We were all seated in the family room. Santiago was playing chess against himself. My mother was flipping through her hundreds of album covers, her collection. My sisters were all glued to the television watching the Cartoon Network. I was reclining in a chair, redoing one of my fingernails when the doorbell rang. Santiago answered. When the door opened, he stood face to face with Midnight. Midnight looked Santiago dead in the eye and said, we need to talk. Santiago led him into the den. I jumped off the reclining chair and tiptoed to the den door. Plastering my ear against the side of the wall, Midnight told Santiago slowly and respectfully, I know you love your daughter and so do I. Santiago's face first held a look of surprise, then grew vexed. He remained cool. As he leaned forward about to speak, Midnight quickly went on. I know what I need to do as a man. I've been working on it for a long time and now I'm ready. I wanted you to be sure that I'm for real, that my love for your daughter is for real. Midnight reached into his inside pocket and pulled out an elegant black velvet ring box. He cracked it open and the two carat diamonds sparkled. My, noise, my nosy eyes beamed in on the stone. I want to marry Winter, Midnight said firmly. I surround her with the finest things in life, like she deserves, like you always have. My finances are solid, stashed away, ready. Maybe we'll buy a house up here, live next door to you. Santiago smiled at the idea of keeping me within arm's reach. My inside screamed, hell no, not here. My heart interrupted and said, okay, anywhere with your fine ass, pay motherfucker. Santiago said, winter is young. Yes, Midnight said sternly, young and beautiful, like your wife was when you two married. Santiago checked Midnight's face to make sure that Midnight meant no ill by his comment. Then Midnight took control. I respect you as a man, Santiago. I always have. I value your business and have served you well. But I'm my own man, and this is what I want. So, what do you say? What's up? Santiago embraced Midnight as Midnight's face pressed against Santiago's shoulder. He looked at me and said with that masculine authority that made me hot. Pack your stuff, shorty. It's me and you from here on out. Excited but not wanting to appear desperate, I threw my hands on my hip and said, Let's see what you have there. Midnight opened the box and took out the ring as he placed it on my finger. The phone rang, jerking me out of my sleep. Ruining my dream, if only could have rung, after the love scene. I snatched the telephone as my sleepy eyes checked the digital on my dresser. Six o'clock in the fucking morning. What do you want? It was Natalie, she laughed. My long distance is working. Hey, wake up, hooker. So what happened? Where did you go? Did you get it? How was it? Was it small? Was it big? She fired questions like bullets. My mind was still sleepy. I needed enough energy to get my lies straight because I was definitely about to tell some lies. We went out for a little late night, early morning breakfast. Where, she demanded. He took me to one of those big fancy diners in Queens. He had steak and eggs with potatoes. I had the shrimp and the fries. Shrimp and fries? That's not breakfast food. Girl, you know I don't eat breakfast. Anyway, Natalie screamed. Get to the good part. Before I could even start talking, she was filling in the blanks for herself. Oh my God, wait till Tasia finds out about this. It's on now. Now, Natalie bringing that whole Tasia's name up only gave me fuel. After breakfast, me and Midnight got back in the car. He took me to one of those lookout spots by the river. He started kissing me. Girl, his lips were so big and warm. He started rubbing my titties with those big ass strong hands. Girl, I thought I was going to explode. He started taking off my shirt, and that's when I went Brooklyn on his ass. What? She screamed. What happened? I told the nigga, look, don't you try to play me out. If I'm going to take off my clothes, you're going to have to take off yours, too. You want to see my body? Oh, well, it's all here, but I want to see your body, too. No, you didn't. Yes, I did, I said. So what happened? He took off his shirt and said, now you take off yours. So I did. 
He took off his pants and said, now you take off yours. So I did. Oh, shit. Natalie was going ballistic. Then what? He took off his drawers and said, now take off yours. Did you? I damn sure did, girl. I looked at his big ass black balls laying against that soft white leather car seat, and that was it. We got busy. Was anybody looking? Hell no. I don't know. We weren't worrying about that. After that wild sex, we just chilled butt naked. Him and his seat butt naked, me and my seat butt naked, puffing lie. Get out of here, you lying, Natalie screamed. Uh-uh, girl, that's for real. I made sure my sweet sunk into that car leather just to let every other bitch know I was there. The next bitch that gets into this car is going to smell me all over. We both laughed. That's it for chapter three. Go ahead and subscribe. Hit the like button. Hit Turn on your notification bell. And send it to your friends. Make sure you turn on the notification so you'll know the next time I upload. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.